Hello learners. Welcome back to my chemistry education channel. Remember to subscribe and hit the notification button so that you can be notified once a new video is uploaded. Hi, I'm teacher Thaddeus Baluka, your chemistry mentor. In our today's lesson, in our today's lesson, we are focusing on analysis of inorganic qualitative analysis that is test for cations and anions. So this one we are going to do in this particular lesson, I'll be able to use a special technique called the, the octopus technique, which is a graphical way of representing our ideas and concepts in a manner that is very easy for you to understand. So work with me as I try to navigate uh, through this particular topic. I'll be able to demystify the secrets of understanding the qualitative analysis. In my lesson, as usual, I'm very precise and I always focus on three major areas. That is what is tested. We focus on what is tested, how it is tested. We focus on what is tested, how it is tested, and what is expected. We focus on those particular three areas. So in all what I'm going to talk about, make sure that you also be able to get a copy of Demystifying Chemistry Practical Guide, which has practical guide notes model KCC items, and that it has all the KCC papers from 1995 to 2019, coordinated market schemes, and I've also highlighted on the common errors that the student makes. So watch this particular lesson and be able to understand by the end of the day that uh, for further more detailed notes, examples, you pick a copy of Demystifying Chemistry Protocol. So I'll start on focusing on the concept map. In your exam that you expect to sit, paper three, this particular area you expect to get question two that carries between 10 to 14 marks. The cation that can be tested are as follows. We have the Kufefe group, that is iron two. Iron two, uh, copper two, and iron three. That's why I talk about kufefe. That is for copper and the two iron ions, iron two and iron three. Those are the colored ions. That's why they're grouped together. Then we have the, the bosoham, that is the, the mnemonic. The tricks that you can be able to remember, that is sodium, potassium, and ammonium. That is bosoham, potassium, sodium, and ammonium. There is no particular reaction that can confirm presence or absence of this because they don't form any precipitates. So there's no particular range that can be used to test these cations. Then we have the ZAP, that is zinc, aluminum, and lead. Zinc, aluminum, lead, you call it ZAP. Why are they grouped together? They form a white precipitate, which is soluble in excess sodium hydroxide. Then we have the other group is calcium and magnesium. Come, these are cations that form a white precipitate which is insoluble in excess sodium hydroxide. Then we have the palm, Pamela, palm, that is lead, aluminum ions, and magnesium ions. That is palm, lead, aluminum and magnesium ions. These cations, they form a white precipitate which is insoluble in excess aqueous ammonia. So they form a white precipitate when you had aqueous ammonia dropoids and when you had excess, the precipitate is insoluble. That is the palm. Then finally, we have the caleb, calcium, 
lead, and barium. Caleb, calcium, lead, and barium. This one, they form, these cations, they form a white precipitate with a soluble sulfate. That is, for instance, sulfuric acid, sodium sulfate. So those are the cations that can be tested in the exam, period. Those are the cations that can be tested there. Those are the only cations that respect. So as you analyze, you must be able to understand that the standard testing way is that wherever an examiner is setting an exam, it'll give you a reagent that is going to give you more than one option. So the far reagent is either going to, to like for example, you can add sodium hydroxide, then you get a white precipitate, which is insoluble in excess. That is magnesium and calcium. And it is important to understand that barium is not among those cations that form a white precipitate, which is insoluble in excess sodium hydroxide or in excess aqueous ammonia. Barium ion does not form a precipitate with either aqueous ammonia or sodium hydroxide. So the analysis that the reagent that we use to test for cations are the, these are the reagents you're going to interact with. For cations, as simple as that, these are the only reagent that you're going to interact with. And the one of the reagent is one of the reagent is ammonia. Aqueous ammonia and sodium hydroxide. This one they test for most of the cations. We also have sodium sulfate and sulfuric acid. This one they test for calcium, for lead, and barium. They test for that, for calcium, lead, and barium, because remember, uh, this one, this is the Caleb group. They are tested using a soluble sulfate. We have HCl and sodium chloride. They test for lead because lead chloride is insoluble, so they can be used to test for lead. Although silver is also forms a, a white precipitate with a, either AC, a hydrochloric acid or a sodium chloride, is not in the syllabus. It's not in the syllabus, therefore, it's rarely tested. We have potassium iodide and lead 2 ions and iron 3. So this one is used to test for lead ions and iron 3 ions, the potassium iodide. Then you also have hydrogen peroxide, which is used to test for iron two ions. We have the universal indicator, which can be used to test for iron three and aluminum three ions. And somebody might ask how? Because these two ions, the iron three and aluminum ions, they hydrolyze in water forming acidic solution. It is important to understand there is a fallacious misnomer. There is a a very general assumption that is a song, uh, that many students assume the only salt that hydrolyzes is aluminum chloride. That's not correct. It is any sort of aluminum, aluminum sulfate, aluminum nitrate, even the double salt, ammonium, aluminum sulfate, will hydrolyze in in solution to form acidic solution. So it is the, the charge density. Any cation with a charge density of positive three and above will hydrolyze in water forming acidic solution. So it is normally for iron three and aluminum three ion. You can insert in vaso indicator paper and test the pH. You're likely going to get a pH of one. Then you say strongly acidic. Starch indicator can be used to test iron three ions. I'll be able to explain how. I'll be able to explain how it is used. So from now, we can be able to have a look at now, how do these reagents, how are they used? So I'm just going to use a simple chart, the octopus technique chart to simplify the analysis of a cation. And I want you to listen very, very carefully. So by the end of the list lesson, make sure that you're able to know the use of this and what they test for. Very important. So, of course, this one we talked about, the colored ions, we have the iron two, 
uh, uh, copper two and iron three. The phosphorus, this one, they don't form any precipitate with all the reagents. Potassium hydroxide, not ammonia, sodium hydroxide, aqueous ammonia, even sodium sulfate. Zap, these cations form a white precipitate with sodium hydroxide, which is soluble in excess. This due to the aboteric nature of the hydroxides of zinc, aluminum, and lead. Cation or magnesium, they form a white precipitate with sodium hydroxide, which is insoluble in excess. There's the Pamela group, that is the palm, lead, aluminum, magnesium, they form a white precipitate, which is insoluble in excess aqueous ammonia. Then we have the Caleb group, they form a white precipitate with a soluble sulfate, e.g. sulfuric acid and sodium sulfate. Very important to be able to capture that. Remember that the only reagent thereby you talk about effect on dropwise and in excess is only the the what is only the sodium hydroxide and aqueous ammonia, but not any other reagent. Some students, even when they have a nitrate, they tell us white PPT is soluble in excess, white PPT is soluble in excess. That is not correct. The only solution you're, talk, you're supposed to talk about the effect of adding dropwise and in excess is only when you are adding aqueous ammonia and sodium hydroxide. Let's look at this analysis now. Our starting point is solution X, is solution X. The solution X can be, a, can be we, can, we have two kind of a scenario, whereby we have the color diodes. The solution X can be a color diode. The color ion that are there, we only have iron two ions, iron three, and copper two ions. When you get a blue solution, the only solution that is there is going to be copper. Copper is the only blue solution. So to test it further, you can add sodium hydroxide, you get a blue precipitate, which is insoluble in excess. You confirm that is copper ion present. You can add excess aqueous ammonia and you get a blue precipitate with soluble in excess to form a deep blue solution. That is the confirmatory test for copper whereby it forms a blue precipitate, which dissolves in excess to form a deep blue solution. We can also have a yellow solution. When we get a yellow solution, this is normally a solution of iron-3 ion. And it is important to understand that iron-3 ions are yellow, but the precipitate is brown. So, when you have this kind of a scenario, when you have this kind of a scenario, it's important to understand that there are two ways of testing that. You can also test for the you can also test for pH. You're going to get pH one. And number two, you can also add this. Eh? You can also add. You can also add a starch. You can also add a starch combined with potassium iodide. You can also add potassium iodide and the starch. First of all, when you add potassium iodide, the, the, the iron 3 ion is an oxidizing agent. So it will oxidize iodide ions in potassium iodide to iodine. And the iodine will combine with the starch to form a blue solution. So you can add potassium iodide followed by starch. The iron-3 ions are oxidizing agents. They will oxidize potassium iodide to iodine. And if you add starch, you're going to see a blue solution. Not blue-black, it is blue solution. Very simple. This is not biology, this is chemistry. The other thing that can be tested on iron-3 is the universal indicator. You can test the pH using an universal indicator. You're going to say, get pH 1, and then you say, this is strongly acidic. 
you can also add potassium iodide alone. When you add potassium iodide alone, it will be oxidized by iron 3 to form iodine. So the solution will, you are going to get a brown solution formed, or rather a black solid is deposited. Remember, iodine is, the iodide ions are being converted to iodine. Iodine solution is brown. But as the concentration of iodine increases, it's going to solidify and get deposited as a black solid. So we can mark either brown solution formed or black solid formed. The inference in such kind of a scenario will be iodide ions oxidize to iodine. Very important. Then, because it's an acidic solution, you can also add sodium hydroxide. You can also add sodium hydroxide and you're going to see a brown precipitate. If you add sodium hydroxide or aqueous ammonia, you're going to see a brown precipitate, which is insoluble in excess. You can also um, add, you can also add sodium carbonate and you're going to see bubbles of a gas because that's the, so the presence of iron three will form a brown precipitate with either sodium hydroxide or aqueous ammonia. With sodium carbonate, because this is acidic, we're also going to see bubbles of a gas, very important. So the test for iron three can be, you can test the pH, you can add potassium chloride, whereby you're going to see a brown solution, and the inference will be iodide ion oxidized to iodine. You can also add potassium iodide, then starch. Remember, we, have, we are oxidizing iodide to iodine. So if you add starch, it's going to react with starch with iodine to form the blue solution, which is the starch iodine complex. So whatever you see is blue, blue solution, not blue black, very important. We can continue and we see a green solution. Wherever you see a green solution, this is the color of iron two ions and copper two ions. Very important. Many students only think green is the color of iron two, it is wrong. Green is the color of either iron two ions or copper two ions. To differentiate copper and iron two ions, you can add aqueous ammonia. And you're going to see green PPT, green PPT form does iron. And blue PPT is soluble in excess to form a deep blue solution, that will be copper. So if it is copper, if it is copper, you can carry out displacement. So displacement is only for copper ions. This is only when you are using copper ions. This is for copper. Not any other, but for copper. This is for copper ions. So this one is for copper. So this kind of the, the displacement reaction, we are using it for, for copper. This one we are using it for for copper ions. This one we are using it for copper, not for any other. So, so the displacement is applicable mostly, the displacement is applicable mostly for copper ions. So for the copper, in case if you are confirmed, the ions present here is copper. If you are confirmed the ion present here is copper, then you can add zinc or iron powder to carry out displacement. Now with copper, you're going to see brown solid deposited. Brown solid deposited, you're also going to see bubbles of a gas. Then you're going to see, because this one will be given like add solid, you can be told to add solid G, add solid H. Then you can say solid G is above copper in the reactivity series. Solid G, or you can say the solid added is above copper in the reactivity series and copper ions have been displaced from a solution of either ion. Remember the chronology of setting this question will be as follows. First of all, you'll have to analyze that sort unless you confirm, until you confirm it, it, it is what? Copper ions. Then now you carry out displacement. Very important for you to be able to capture that. Number two, 
if it's green solution, that's how you able to analyze it further. So if now you have added this, you can also add sodium hydroxide, you're going to get green BPT insoluble, green precipitate insoluble in excess sodium hydroxide, iron two. Blue precipitate insoluble in excess copper two ions. But now, if you have confirmed now it is iron, so this test will apply if you have already confirmed the ion present is what? Iron. So this one of now adding, this one of now adding, adding nitric five acid or hydrogen peroxide. This is what is going to apply in a practical setup. In a practical, we cannot use conk acid, but we are likely going to use hydrogen peroxide. So this is an oxidizing agent. So this one is applying for iron two ions. So when you add an oxidizing agent, the iron two ions will be oxidized to iron three. So the green solution will turn to yellow. The green solution turns yellow. Then you say iron two oxidized to iron three. Remember the examiner can also tell you to add hydrogen peroxide followed by aqueous ammonia or sodium hydroxide. There are two observations expected in that scenario. There are two observations expected there. One, after adding hydrogen peroxide, there'll be green solution turn yellow. Then on adding sodium hydroxide or aqueous ammonia, a brown precipitate will be formed. The inference will still be the same. Iron two ions oxidize to iron three. Very important. Now we can also now go to now the colorless ions. We can have a look at the colorless ions. We can be able to have a look at the colorless ions. We can have a look at the colorless ions. With the, color, with the colorless ions, now in case the solution now is giving us a colorless ion, so rather is giving us this kind of a scenario here. In case the solution is giving us rather, let me be able to erase that. So now we're having the, we're having the colorless ions. The colorless ions, we can add sodium hydroxide. When you add sodium hydroxide, there are two scenarios you can see here. No white precipitate. So when you're adding sodium hydroxide, you are looking for two things. We are looking for three things, in fact. Is there a precipitate? What is the color of that precipitate? And is the precipitate soluble or insoluble in excess? So you must mention the color of the precipitate, the effect of addition of dropwise and in excess. But we can also have a scenario whereby there is no white precipitate. So when there is no white precipitate, it rules out presence of the cations that give a white PPT soluble and white precipitate, which is insoluble. So that rules out the zap and the cam. So if there is no precipitate, you could rule out zinc, aluminum, lead, calcium, and magnesium abuzet. Not sodium, potassium, and ammonium present. It is the zinc aluminum, lead, calcium, and magnesium abusant. Very important. The other option of adding sodium hydroxide, you can get a white precipitate, which is soluble in excess. Remember the color of the precipitate and whether it's soluble or insoluble. So white precipitate, which is insoluble in excess. Zinc, aluminum, lead ions present. How do you differentiate that? To differentiate the zap, zinc, aluminum, lead, because I told you, after now you have got this, you have to know how do you differentiate each of them. Then you get, you can add excess aqueous ammonia. White precipitate soluble, that will be zinc. White precipitate, which is insoluble, it is aluminum or lead. So now we have already eliminated zinc. We are now remaining with aluminum and lead. How do you differentiate lead and aluminum? 
you invoke, you try to apply the knowledge of solubility. Lead sulfate and lead chloride are is insoluble in water. So therefore, you add a soluble chloride or soluble sulfate. So that in case lead is present, you'll see a white precipitate. So there are four reagents you can add here. Sodium sulfate or sulfuric acid. Sodium chloride or hydrochloric acid. What are you looking for? A white precipitate because lead chloride and lead sulfate is insoluble. So if you add any of those four reagents, white precipitate confirm presence of lead. No white precipitate confirm presence of aluminum. I remember on adding here, if there is white PPT, it is lead present. If there is no white PPC, it is aluminum present, not lead absent. Because your qualitative analysis uses elimination method. You have analyzed your cations and you're in this step whereby you only have two options. It either going to be aluminum or lead. The addition of sodium chloride or hydrochloric acid is looking for presence of lead, but whereby we expect to see a white precipitate. So it is white precipitate, lead. No white PPT, that confirms lead is absent. But if lead is absent, what is present? Aluminium, very important. I remember it is no white precipitate, not a colorless solution is formed. A common mistake students talk about. You only talk about a solution is formed when you are adding distilled water. Another reagent, you can also differentiate lead and aluminum ions by adding potassium iodide, whereby you're going to see a yellow precipitate, lead, ion, lead ions present, no yellow precipitate, aluminum ions present. Very important. The other option, you can add sodium hydroxide and you'll get a white precipitate which is insoluble in excess. And that is magnesium or calcium ions present. To differentiate between magnesium and calcium, you can add excess aqueous ammonia. Whereby you're going to say, get, if for example, you are talking about now, if you add aqueous ammonia, calcium ions do not form a precipitate with aqueous ammonia. If, so you're going to see a white precipitate insoluble, that is what? That is magnesium. White precip no white precipitate is calcium. So white precipitate insoluble, that is magnesium. No precipitate, calcium. You can also differentiate calcium and magnesium by using a soluble sulfate, sodium sulfate or dilute sulfuric acid because calcium sulfate is insoluble. So no white precipitate, it is magnesium. That is now when you add sodium sulfate or sulfuric acid, if you get no white precipitate, it is magnesium present. If there is a white precipitate, it is calcium present. That is how you can be able to analyze this qualitative and for cations using the octopus technique. Remember what I said that uh, whenever you're adding that, you have to know what is tested, how it is tested, and what is expected. Remember here we are using starch combined with potassium iodide. We are using potassium iodide and starch. Very important for you to be able to capture that particular point. Very important. And number two, again, the whatever I said, when you add sodium hydroxide, you don't say a colorless solution is formed. You talk about no white precipitate. The only reagent you talk about the solution is formed is when you're adding distilled water, not when you're adding sodium hydroxide or aqueous ammonia. Remember the Pamela group, you can also start by adding aqueous ammonia whereby you get a white precipitate insoluble in excess. That is lead, aluminum, magne magnesium. So to differentiate the three, you can add sodium and rupture, whereby you're going to get white PPT soluble. That will be 
lead and aluminum. White PPT, which is insoluble, that confounds it magnesium. I've said you can also start by adding aqueous ammonia instead of sodium hydroxide. And you get there are two options there. White precipitate soluble in aqueous ammonia. Of course, that is only zinc. We can also have white precipitate, which is insoluble, that is lead, aluminium, magnesium. So in our next lesson, we'll be able to continue demystifying. I'll be able to continue illuminating and packing more of the qualitative analysis. So for today, we are stopping there. I'll also be able to unpack the test for anions using the qualitative analysis. Until next time, keep watching, keep it here at the uh, Darius Baluka uh, Chemistry uh, Education Channel as we continue to make chemistry simpler, as we try to demystify, you're going to illuminate and demystify chemistry with a sense of humor, with passion, so that it becomes a little bit simpler for you.